Today I want to talk to you about, we're in a, a series right now called uh, Tis the Season, and today the title is called I'll Be Home for Christmas. I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. Who is normally at your Christmas tables? Who usually gathers uh, at your tables over the holidays and during the Christmas time. Uh, you know, when I was a, a little boy uh, raised by my grandparents for quite a few years, we would either be at Nanny and Papa's house in Ashwood, South Carolina, a little community outside of Bishopville, or we would ride 25 miles. How many of you remember when 25 miles seemed like forever? It's like, man, we're going 25 miles from Ashwood to Camden, South Carolina, metropolis of probably a few thousand people. You know, that was a huge thing. And we would either have Christmas dinner. Sometimes it probably would be Thanksgiving at one and Christmas at the other. We'd be at Nanny and Papa's or we would go to Uncle Etzel's and Aunt Darlene's Christmas. Then later, I uh, moved in with my brother in Kentucky, and for those that, uh, you know, Kentucky's a little bit further away, you know, Kentucky, if you live in South Carolina, Kentucky is not Southern, it's, it's just a whole different part of the world, and lived in Kentucky, and uh, uh, when we had Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner, uh, on Christ I'm telling you, you would not believe who would come out of the woodwork come out the hills of Kentucky and be there. I mean, family, uh, my sister-in-law can flat out cook. It's no joke. And people would come out and, I mean, there would be so many people uh, at the Christmas gathering, you know, but it always seems like there was more, you know, there's always room around the table for others. I, I remember one thing that uh, was cooked in, kind of cooked, I think you cook it, in South Carolina, a fruit cake. I don't know why they are called fruit cakes. I don't why, know why anybody makes them. If you make them, let me give you a little heads up. You should you should just go ahead and stop. <laughs> now I love my grandmother. She had made these fruit cakes put these little fake green things in there and fake little red things. And it's like, is that really fruit now? And what does it taste like? I'd open up the cabinet and she had this little secret thing, towel over it. I don't know how long it'd been in that cabinet getting ready for Christmas Day, fruit cake. That's for free. Lots of conversations would take place around the tables, either at my brother's or Aunt, Aunt Darlene's house or Nanny and Papa's. We'd have tons of fun remembering. I mean, there was a season where all my cousins, it seemed like, or most of us had dirt bikes, and, and especially if you got one on, on Christmas. And a lot of mischief things kind of took place around uh, among the cousins. I remember at Aunt uh, Darlene's house, uh, my cousin Eric, he's passed away. He was killed in a terrible car wreck when he was 17. But before that, he, man, Eric was like a brother to me, one year older than me. He was probably 15, uh, and I was probably 14. And I'm in Ed and Eric's room. That's my two first cousins, Ed and Eric. And Ed was a couple of years older. And Eric, all of a sudden, you know, probably on Christmas Day or right around, probably was Christmas Day, he decides to pull out a rifle, and he points it right at me. And I just didn't think that was cool. They thought it was funny that I didn't like Eric pointing a gun at me right between my eyes. So I slapped the gun and took off running. And when I got to the door, he shot me. <laughs> I'm like, you just shot me. 22 shot me in the hip. It felt like all I could think was was lava. If you've ever been shot, you don't got to raise your hand, but I'm telling you, it's hot. 
And so praise God that it wasn't a, a, a bullet. It was what they call like bird shot or rat shot within the 22. But how many of you remember the, back in the 80s or maybe the 70s, Levi Corduroys? I mean, they were sick, dope, man. Rusty Brown. I got him for Christmas. And he shot me in my brand new Levi Corduroys. I got it just jacked, I mean, just wasted them. Well, did I go to the doctor? No, because Uncle Etzel's there. I stand in front of Uncle Etzel's recliner, and he pulls out probably this really amazing, you know, clean pocket knife. And he starts digging the lead out. Oh my God. Did you ever go to the doctor? No. I think lead has popped out, you know, since then. I'm not sure. But those are the kinds of Christmases that we were around. There's no telling what was going to take place. And it was pretty interesting. But we always gathered around the table. And uh, never knew what was going to happen around the table. And uh, it always seemed like there was room for others around the table. I got a question for you today. Is there room for others around your table this season? Is there people that are not like you, nothing like you? Is there room around your table for those that absolutely are a bit different uh, from you. I want to read a, 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 a bit of a parable. It's out of Luke 14, 15, and it says this. If you have your Bibles, that's wonderful. I encourage you uh, to bring them. I just want to begin reading. We're going to talk about this for a few minutes. Luke 14, 15, it says, Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, everyone say table, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And Jesus begins to tell a story, a parable. Next verse, it says, Jesus replied with this story, a man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, how many of you love it on Christmas Day when they say, oh, it's time to eat, come and get it. How many of y'all like that? I whew, Turkey and Stuffing, fruitcake. <laughs> when the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. It's always cool when the dinner time uh, is ready. And, you know, at different times, some people do it around noon, some people three or some people at nighttime. But when you think about a banquet, uh, I think about something that looks a bit like this. You know, you pull out the banquet, you pull out all the nice china and silverware and table coverings and, 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 and you know, people fancy dress, fancy clothes and, you know, makeup and jewelry and just, just a, a great banquet. But, you know, when it comes down to it, I would say that most of the people here, our Christmas looks a little bit more like this than it does like that. How, how many of yours look like this? You always got a couple in the room, you know, praise God. There's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. I had like three last night and one this morning. And How many of you, your tables and, you know, Christmas maybe looks a little bit, maybe not exactly like this. I mean, we pulled out some stuff around the church, but it looks a little bit more like this. If your table looks a little more, raise your hand. How many of you just don't even celebrate Christmas because your hand didn't go up on either one? <laughs> How many of you somewhere between here and there? Good, good, good. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, it's funny because, you know, we have different chairs around the table here because, you know, around the table, there's all kinds of different people that show up. You, you, got, you got 
aunt that's kind of, you know, just control freak and you got everything just perfect. And, you know, that's just your aunt. You, you, then you got your uncle who's absolutely awkward. You have no clue what m- might come out of his mouth. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, here we go. Then you got a third cousin that you only see uh, at Christmas and nobody really knows who he is. <laughs> Then you got the dude that's married to, to one of the ladies that you know the lady, but you don't know, you know, brown recluse. He comes out at Christmas time and it's like, and then you got, you know, you have all these people around uh, your table at, at, at Christmas time, Thanksgiving, at least at some times. And uh, I, I want to keep on with the parable. In the parable, the man sent out his servants to let everyone know, hey, this great banquet is ready. But they got the news, and the news was, hey, listen, uh, the, the servant heard back from the folks that the, the man sent him out to invite. He says, you know, these guys, you know, they were making excuses. One got married. He's like, hey, man, I got a wife now. And, you know, bought some oxen and bought a field. He goes back to tell the guy they're all busy, and here's a scripture. Here, 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 here's what the guy uh, says there. The servant returned and told the master what they had said. The master was furious and said, go quickly to the streets and alleys of the town and invite, look, look what it says, invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And when it comes down to it, there, there's probably people in this room right now that, that your, your Christmas table, it may look a, a lot like more like the latter than uh, from the beginning. That doesn't mean that everyone's, but it can look a little bit different at your table. It may have some poor, not just poor financially, but it may be poor in spirit. They just, they just have no belief in Jesus Christ, or maybe they've walked a, away from Christ, wasn't raised in the church. And I want to let you know, God wants to work through your life to touch those who are poor in spirit. Look what, look what the Beatitudes says, be, what, what you be like with your attitude. The Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 3. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Might be some poor around your table. There may be some who are handicapped. It doesn't mean it has to be physically handicapped. It can be emotionally handicapped, mentally handicapped. But they, they may have a handicap. I, I love the story. There's a story of King David, one of the, I mean, to me, the greatest king to ever exist. And Saul was killed, and Jonathan was killed in in battle, and Saul was kind of out there. But David always honored Saul. And after Saul was dead and his son Jonathan was dead, he just went out to see how he could show kindness toward the lineage of Saul. And he found one of Saul's grandsons. And this grandson was the son of Jonathan. And this young man had been dropped and had been crippled And you know what David did? David, I think for the rest of his life, David had him eat at the king's table to show kindness to Saul and his family. You may have someone that's blind or either uh, physically, but more more so probably spiritually blind that comes uh, to your Christmas table. I want you to see today. I want you to see who Jesus had around his table. Jesus had these 12 dudes around his table. I call them the dirty dozen. I know that people get some kind of weird religious thought when they come to the disciples, but I'm going to tell you right now, man, the disciples were absolutely some jacked up dudes. And that's all there is to it. He didn't go to the religious. Man, he brought people up from the grassroots because he didn't want to have uh, the things that the Pharisees and Sadducees had been part of. He wasn't, tra- he wasn't going to retrain, man. He brought these guys up from the grassroots to be his disciples. So I want you to think about the Last Supper for a moment and see who Jesus made room around his table for. One of the guys' name was Judas. How many of you remember Uh, Judas out of the Bible. 
Judas, very unique that, that, uh, that Jesus would have him around his table because Judas, first of all, he was a treasure, just a treasure of the disciples and Jesus. And it's kind of it's kind of interesting because you couldn't trust the dude, and I'm sure he ripped off the treasure box, but he was a treasure, and he was also the traitor. Uh, even people that don't go to church, they've heard of Judas before. Hey, you're a Judas. I mean, he was a traitor, but he wasn't just a traitor, and he wasn't just a, 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 a disciple, and he wasn't just a treasure. He was also at one point at the table with Jesus and demon-possessed. How would you like to have demon-possessed people at your Christmas table? It happened. I'm going to read a couple scriptures just so that you can see the, listen to me, the social life of Jesus. I think we even have a wrong view of who Jesus is and a wrong view of who his disciples is and how and who Jesus made room for around his table. And when I talk about table today, I'm not just talking about your Christmas table and chairs, but I'm talking about this table right here. Do you have room around your table for people who are not like you that might be awkward a little bit uncomfortable and those that you I don't know about that John 13 2 it was time for supper and the devil had already prompted Judas son of Simon help me out with that eye thank you to portray Jesus. You ever get a word and you know that if you pronounce it the way it looks, it's going to be wrong? Like Ponderé. <laughs> when you move here, you look at Ponderé, you're like, Coeur d'Alene. Look at this one. Verse 27. Judas was eating the bread. Satan entered into him. You know, when we do communion here at the Heart of the City Church, usually we challenge everyone always, now search your heart. It's a good biblical practice. Search your heart. Make sure that you're in good standings with God and others before you receive communion. I want to let you know right now, Judas didn't do that. Satan entered into Judas at the last supper, at the table. Don't, 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 don't think that Jesus didn't know what was going to happen, what was going to take place. Jesus made room for even a Judas at his table. Hurry and do what you're going to do. Man, some of the disciples thought maybe he was going to go buy something or what have you, but it was his portrayal that Jesus was talking about. And then you got this guy, I'm just going to talk about four. You got this guy named Thomas. How many of you remember Thomas, one of the disciples? Doubting Thomas. I mean, you walk with Jesus probably three and a half years. Jesus probably spent more time with 12 disciples than anyone on the face of the earth, even his family during that time. You have this Thomas cat, and he doesn't believe. He's doubting. He doesn't, he's not there when Jesus, you know, I think walked through a wall one time or showed up to the disciples and he's like, no way, I'm not going to believe in Jesus. I'm not going to believe he rose from the dead unless I put my finger in his hand and put my finger in his hand in the side of him. And he was doubting Thomas. I mean, Jesus made room at his table for some very unique individuals. And then you got this guy named Peter. I really like Peter. Peter kind of is an emotional leader. I think Peter, I think how Peter was acting is sometimes how Jesus addressed him. Uh, Simon. Uh, Simon Barjona. Uh, Peter. Uh, Simon Barjona Simon. Why? Because sometimes Peter was just out there. How many of you mothers, you know, if everything's going with your kids good, you're like, hi, Johnny. But if they're not doing good, you're like, Jonathan, William, get your butt over here right now, boy. I mean, it just changes. And it's just like, it's just like Jesus would address Simon, Simon Barjona, Simon Barjona, Peter, according to how he was acting. So on this day, Jesus begins to tell his disciples, this is all happening in the same day in, in John chapter 13. Jesus be, tells his disciples, hey, this is going to take place. Peter pulls him aside and goes, 
There is no way this is going to happen. Look what Jesus says. Satan, (laughs) that's not how you normally address your friend. Satan, get behind me. He goes from Simon Barjuna to Simon Peter, Satan, get behind me. These are the, this is, this is the social life of Jesus Christ. This is who Jesus hung out with. This is who Jesus made room for around his table. Before the day's up, Peter, you're going to deny me. No way. I don't know the dude. And that was Jesus' number one disciple, not number three. Anytime you see the, the, the writings in the New Testament, there is a disciple that's always number one. Guess what his name is? Peter. He's always first. You don't see John, James, Peter, uh, Andrew, uh, Bartholomew. You see Peter, number one. That's so when first mentions are vital in the New Testament. Don't let anyone tell you anything different about that. God's never made a mistake. There was a reason why Peter was number one. And number one disciple who he makes room for at the table is like, I don't know him. And then we go to another guy, Matthew. Matthew, how many of you know what Matthew was? A tax collector. Jesus says one day, walks by Matthew. Matthew begins to follow Jesus. And then Matthew puts on a banquet. I want you to see, Jesus goes to the banquet. Jesus goes to the house. They have a dinner. I would call it a banquet. I think some of the translation calls it a banquet. Having dinner, sitting around, and who does tax collectors typically hang out with? Tax collectors. They ain't going to have no other friends, man. Who's going to hang out with a tax collector other than a tax collector? Except your mama. So now there's another banquet. Matthew just is now following Jesus. And he throws on a dinner. Look what it says Matthew 9, 10 through 13. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with, look, many, is it behind me? Go with me. Many what? And then we're going to take it to another level, not just many tax collectors, but we're, let's go to another level. And other, this, Wow. To separate tax collectors and this reputable sinners. <laughs> wow. This is a crew. They're all around Matthew's table, and Jesus is there kicking back. You think Jesus is sweating bullets there? Like, oh man, I'm surrounded with tax collectors and disreputable sinners, and what am I going to do? Jesus is right. He's good in his skin, and he's right where he wants to be because that's exactly who Jesus came for. Good preaching, J.O. I don't care if you like it or not. <laughs> but when the Pharisees saw this, They asked the disciples, I need you to read with me right here. Just read this question. Is it there? Will you read it with me? Because you need to hear it out of your own voice. Why does your teacher eat with such? Wow. Matthew, you got scum around your table, man. Why you got such scum? Who are you eating with? And Jesus heard this and he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have an amazing Christian physical doctor. I mean, the guys. If you want to go to him, just go to him. I, I, I'm just telling you, he's, a, he's amazing. His name's Dr. Esau. Last time, 
I visited him one time. It wasn't last time I was there, but one time I visited him. He is so stinking incredible. Just talking with him and him being patient and just sitting there, just kicking it with me. I accidentally called him Pastor Esau twice. (laughs) It's no joke. This is no joke. What if I go to Dr. Esau and I go, Dr. Esau, I think I have strep throat, man. It feels like a butcher knife in my throat. I got white things on my tonsils. I'm jacked up. Got a fever, 105. I'm hurting. What if Dr. Esau goes, how? Don't come into my office. This is not the place for you. I deal with healthy patients. You got to go down the road, man. (laughs) Who do you allow around your table? Will you make room at your table this season? Jesus' social life. Listen to this, Luke 15, 1 and 2. And it says this, tax collectors, I, I like this. Here's a new word. Tax collectors and other. (laughs) We're going to go from tax collector to notorious sinners. And it's not even WWF. (laughs) Often came to listen to Jesus teach. I think that is beautiful. Let Heart of the City Church be a church known for tax collectors and notorious sinners filling this place up. That ain't good enough. Let Heart of the City Church be a place of tax collectors and notorious sinners, disruptible, reputable sinners. Let this place be filled with that kind of people. Amen. We got room at our table for you. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people. Uh Uh-oh. And eating with them. I looked up a word. I never looked up this word before. I I, I didn't even know if I was going to find it in the dictionary. I looked up the word riffraff. Because I'm like, Jesus is the Lord and the disciple maker, and the gatherer, and the life changer of a bunch of riffraff folk. And I'm one of them. And it's no joke. So I looked up riffraff. Straight from the dictionary, disreputable or undesirable people. He's the king of disreputable or undesirable people. And I just hit on four disciples. I just hit on Peter, uh, Judas, Thomas, and, 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 and Matt. There's eight other dudes. And he just didn't open up his table to those eight. How many of you remember the story of Zacchaeus? I love Zacchaeus because he was a short little dude. I hope he was shorter. I'm five foot six and a half. I'm thinking he's shorter than me, but I'm not sure. (laughs) And Zacchaeus, let's take it to another level. Zacchaeus was a rich chief tax collector. How you like that? Rich, you know that brother had no friends. Rich chief tax collector. And you know, uh, Jesus is coming in town, and Zacchaeus hears about this Jesus, this Jesus that raises the dead and <laughs> heals lepers and, and just, heal, just, just oh, 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 hangs out with tax collectors, hangs out with notorious sinners. Hey, Jesus, I got to check this Jesus. That's my kind of guy. The brother eats with tax collectors. He likes notorious sinners. I got to see this dude. And Zacchaeus, look what it says. Luke 19, 5, when Jesus came by, because Zacchaeus ran ahead of them, climbed up a, what kind of tree? Oh, yeah. And looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, 
How would you like that? You're all up in a tree. Now think about it. You're up in a tree. Hey, Ben! And it's Jesus. Dwayne! I mean, that gets your attention right there. Craig! It's like, wow. Jesus, the God of the universe, knows my name. And Zacchaeus says, Zacchaeus! He said, come down. Uh, quick, quick, come down. I must, must be a guest in your home today. Guess what you do when you're a guest at someone's home? Don't you think they ate together? Don't you think they hung out together? Jesus connected with this guy. It's absolutely amazing. So number one, Jesus ate with them. Jesus, Jesus ate with them. When you eat with someone, you really talk with them. I think you connect with them typically. You build relationship with folks. John Sanford does a teaching out of the customs. He has amazing teaching from the customs of the Bible. It's beautiful. Matter of fact, it's in his new book. And one of the customary cultural things that took place when you ate with someone is it meant that you forgave them. So when Jesus eats with Zacchaeus, he's forgiven. When Jesus eats with, come on, tax collectors and notorious sinners and disreputable, come on, there is forgiveness. There is a sense of that you belong here. You're home. It's good. with This is a safe place. I mean, Jesus connected with them. Transparency. I can see Jesus praying for them. I could see them having lots of fun, story, remembering. Wednesday morning, I went to City Group. We, we meet, the City Group meets at 7 o'clock at a, at a restaurant. And I tell you what, I just thought Ben was there. And uh, Dwayne, was you there this Wednesday? No, you, you couldn't catch your boat, could you? How do you like to have to catch a boat to get to City Group? Anyway, that's, that's for free. But it just got, it was just amazing because it just got very real. Gen wonderful gentleman began to share his story a little bit. And uh, if he's here, God bless you. I just, he's really cool. And, and, and God just showed up and we began to pray, pray for one another. It was real, man. How many of you know city groups should be real? Let me get a pulse today. How many of you are in a city group? Raise your hand. That's an okay beginning. You are to be in a city group. Jail, I don't, I, don't, I don't know who's going to show up at the city group. I don't know that awkward dude and, you know, her. That's exactly right. That's exactly why you need to be there. Acts 2. They met in the temple, and they met from house to house. It's absolutely Bible. Not just temple. Not just doing a home thing. Both. I highly encourage it. It doesn't have to be at someone's home. It could be right here. But that you're connected in relationship. You're in community. Number two, Jesus served them. Say that with me, served them. John 13, 4 through 5. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped the towel around his waist, poured water into the basin, then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Jesus served the dirty dozen. He didn't just serve 12. Jesus, if you remember, he served 4,000. Uh, Jesus served 5,000. Uh, Jesus served every person in this room today. And Jesus is still serving you. He prays for you constantly, make an intercession for you. Jesus served those when you serve someone, I tell you what, you can make some serious room around the table for them. He didn't just serve them, but he also loved them. He actually loved Peter. He actually loved Judas. He actually loved Matthew. He loved Zacchaeus. He loved the woman caught in adultery. He loved the woman with the issue of blood. He loved blind Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy on me. Stop Jesus in his tracks. 
loved him. Loved him. Loving the unlovable, reaching unreachable. John 13, 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that the hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved, look, look, look. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. Look. And now he loved them to the very end. He loved them to the core. When you serve someone, you love someone, I tell you what, it will change their life. Song of Solomon's 2.4. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. So this, this, this year, and I'm not just talking about Christmas, even though it's wonderful. It may happen at Christmas, but, you know, I'm really more so talking other than just this table. This table. So when you have... Sister of offense right here just gets offended at everything you do. Or you have brother, awkward, uh, never know what's going to happen. You have cousin closet addiction. You have papal prejudice right here. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. You have the little kids over here, but some of you may feel like one of the little kids because you're so separated, just like, do I even belong here? I remember after I got born again, uh, 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 a gentleman had preached to me in Hardy's. I just got through bouncing in the bar, walking into Hardy's, this guy named Roland. He, uh, just a wonderful African-American street preacher in Moorhead, Kentucky. And he just got in my grill and started sharing Jesus with me and so forth and so on. Anyway, down the road later, I got born again. Roland became a very, very good friend of mine. And sad to say in the South, we were raised pretty prejudiced and it's, it's super sad. It's, absolutely ignorant and stupid and you name it it's all those things so I bring Roland home one day I go ahead and bring one of my friends home and walk in we sit at the table everyone's already eating. we sit at the table Roland sits beside me a person who's a brother to someone there at the table takes his plate slams it down leaves two other family members get up and leave and I'm like how many of you know when Jesus comes into your heart, he begins to change you, right? And I look at Roland, I go, hey, bro, man, I'm very sorry. Sorry this is taking place. Roland's like, hey, man, more food for us. <laughs> he was totally down with it. So when you got Papaw prejudice at your table, I want to let you know, look, look, it's all good. Eat with them. Connect with them. Don't you be weird. You might be the awkward one in the room right now. You need to get over that. Don't be weird. <laughs> Serve them if you have an opportunity. Love them. Why? Because Jesus wants to show up at your table. And you know how Jesus shows up these days? Through you. He's, he, he's waiting to show up through you. I'll close with this. My wonderful wife for six months has been struggling with something physical. Her ears and chest and head, and she was flying back from, De uh, not DePaul, what was it called? Dubai. And sat beside someone, and they were hacking. You know how that is. Nothing like being on a 17-hour flight with someone hacking. She thought maybe she caught some from that, and, and then, you know, she kept struggling and so forth and so on. She ended up going to one doctor and nothing changed and went to another doctor and nothing changed. This is over a short period of time because she got really bad over the last six weeks. And she goes to a specialist just this last week. They do a hearing test. They check her out and sits down with the specialist. And the specialist goes, tell me about what's been going on in your life. She says, well, you know, a good friend passed away in August and other folks have passed away in the church and just normal stresses and so forth and so on. And he began, this doctor that Radine had never met, began to minister to Radine, a doctor. Began to pour out comfort upon her. 
She had had ringing in her ears for weeks. Did, she, did he pray for you there or did he say he was going to pray for you? He's going to pray for her. She walks out all the different symptoms that she was having. This specialist says is from stress. Wow. She walks out of the doctor's office. The ringing that had been there for weeks, gone. Why do you say that today? Because Jesus uses you. Jesus wants to use you. Jesus wants you to open up the doors and allow people to come to your table. And he wants to speak through you. He wants to be a minister of reconciliation through you. He wants to bring healing through you. Are you waiting for someone else when Jesus wants to use you? Quit being a rebel and allow him to use you this season. Amen. 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 Who's at your table? Will you make room for others at your table this season?